This video has been supported by PCBWay, who are as reliable as always even in difficult times for the electronics industry. I needed a special accessory for the multimeter we are working with today. A 4 terminal short circuit connector with a few special properties. I wanted pure bare copper for low thermal voltages against its copper input connectors. On a thin substrate with a low thermal mass, so that thermal equilibrium is restored quickly after handling at installation. I wanted no solder mask, no silk screen and no drills, but extensively plated edges. To connect both sides without creating loops. Now I don't know about you, but personally I don't enjoy a lengthy back and forth with a well-meaning service technician. That is why I like PCBWay's detailed ordering form so much. I just enter precisely what I want and usually the production starts within the hour. This complicated order was finished and shipped after only two days. And apparently I've earned enough PCBWay beans for a few extra souvenirs. At the moment PCBWay is holding a hardware design contest where you can win much more than just souvenirs. Submit your best project until the end of November for a chance to win cash prizes, coupons and equipment. And don't worry, my beautiful short circuit connector is not participating, so you have a chance of winning too. More about this part later, and thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Here it is. Hey folks, we've looked at so many exciting multimeters over the years. And I consider myself very fortunate for being able to one-up each and every one of them. So far. Obviously that can't go on forever. There is no Moore's law for DMMs. Eventually we'll reach the peak, and what then? Maybe my gear acquisition syndrome will be cured and I can lead a normal life again. Maybe I can return to metrology grade frog-like galvanometers to keep track of my PPMs? Well we don't have to worry about that just yet, because today I can once again show you a multimeter that outperforms and one-ups everything. I am not saying that lightly, the 8.5 digit units we've featured before were all wonderful in their own ways. But what I have in stock for you today is considered by many to be the best production multimeter period. At first glance it may look like a Keithley from the brown era. It didn't take me long though to see through the deception. It is actually from the brown era, but it's not a Keithley. And neither is it brown. Huh? Who can tell without looking at the title? Oh yeah, it is a prime specimen of an HP 3458A. An absolute dream coming true right here. I've met one 80 years ago and been wanting one of my own ever since. But somehow the prices kept rising like crazy over the last couple of years and my piggy banks never lived long enough. This invaluable meter along with a generous side dish of hermetically sealed components has been donated by a viewer. No amount of thank yous could do such a generous gift justice. But I got the impression that this engineer and test gear enjoyer has the motivation, the materials and the knowledge to produce high-end equipment repair documentaries of his own. If that is something you'd like to see, please subscribe to the Extra Solar YouTube channel. Give him a little head start and in a way say thanks on my behalf. And maybe ask some questions about this particular resistor. That would be wonderful. Now as another cherry on top, this meter is giving me what looks like its entire repertoire of error codes. The Cal required messages immediately after startup are not that critical. They just mean that some non-volatile memory was not even able to do its one job in life of remembering stuff. That'll be an easy fix. The absence of measurement results and the 114 system error, multi-slope rundown convergence are a lot more disconcerting. In fact, after having soaked up and nerded out on all the materials that are available for this iconic multimeter for years, I guess it's the number one error that you hope to never see it throw. Oh, but after clearing all the errors it suddenly starts to work. That was easy. Unfortunately, only for longer integration times and not very reliably at all. I guess I could write a script that clears errors periodically and fetches whatever readings it can get in between. But the keywords multi-slope and convergence hint towards an issue at the 3458A's very core. Its custom multi-slope analog to digital converter implementation is what makes it famous and so desirable. I suspect that with a defect down there we wouldn't get to see any of its good performance. Although 750 nanovolt certainly is a lot closer to zero than what we got before with floating inputs. So who knows, maybe it's just something trivial. 
Before we take the plunge, how about a brief historic overview? It's the 1980s in beautiful Loveland, Colorado. At the foot of the Rocky Mountains, Hewlett Packard's Loveland division, previously in charge of their calculator and RGB gaming PC business, is now pursuing much more interesting goals. They are now developing, manufacturing and servicing multimeters. Their top of the line line, the 3450 series, has been around for a while. But as in the same decade the first Josephson voltage standards come to life, previously existing instrumentation turns out to be just not good enough for them. All the competing voltmeter manufacturers from all over the world set out to breach the final frontier of DCV precision. The data is sparse, but as far as I can tell, the Europeans got there first with the Solartron Schlumberger 7081, released somewhere between 1983 and 85. The German Prema 6048, the British Datron 1281, and today's American protagonist, the HP 3458A, were all released between 1988 and 89. Keithley 2002 came last, but for that it gets the most pleasant user interface and form factor. Today the Solartron and Prema models are no more. Fluke has bought the Datron design and has put an absolutely futuristic user interface on top of it. Keithley 2002 is alive and well, as you can see in my video about it not too long ago. Keysight now owns the 3458A design and they have only just released a beautiful new dark theme instrument based on exactly the same proven foundation from the 80s. They also still have a calibration and service center in Loveland, Colorado, which I think is super cool. I love how they are reusing the 3458A terminal blocks everywhere. From a mechanical perspective we've got some very nice binding posts on here. No complicated modifications necessary this time, only some cleaning with deoxid gold. The metrology grade q-tip still applies, but not to wedge cables in there this time. I have to say though, those look neither coppery nor golden. Surely they can't be brass, right? That would be unacceptable. I'm going to believe in gold-plated copper until I know more. This whole terminal block feels a bit loose somehow. I might have to go deeper and check that out. The long history and the complete lack of competition in terms of DC voltage performance today really makes you wonder what made this 1980s design so exceptionally good. That's the thing, I don't know either. But we can look for clues in here and maybe fill in the gaps with rumors and superstitions from the internet. Actually, that might not be necessary because schematics and builds of materials are public, as well as a certain HP journal full of lore. The most keen observers might be able to tell that there are a few non-standard details in here already. That's because I had a bit of a data accident and had to refilm a few things. But don't worry, no quirks and features whatsoever will be left out. This is the A1 board, the biggest one in the whole instrument and the one with the most functions. It accepts the input signal from that vertical board with a manual front rear switch and some protection circuitry and it sends it to the desired function with that cluster of fancy Koto read relays. The ADC on a different board can only digest, um, I mean digitize, DC voltages between plus and minus 10. So every other possible input signal has to be prepared for its convenience. Low DC voltages in the millivolt and the one volt ranges are amplified by a discrete precision amplifier. Its selectable gain of times 10 or times 100 has to be ultra stable because drift thereof would directly translate into meter inaccuracy in those lower ranges. That's why the gain is configured by a custom high quality resistor network. The DC current ranges use this path too, after the currents have been translated into low voltages by these not too impressive shunt resistors. And of course the lower ohms ranges use this path too, after translating resistances to voltages using one of six precision current sources. Those are based on an even better looking custom resistor network in a ceramic dip package. One might think that for maximum accuracy the 10 volt range could be allowed to pass right through untouched. Unfortunately not possible, because the ADC on its own does not have the extremely high input impedance that one expects from the highest end voltmeter. There are a few more things on here which we have to cover later, but right now I can't resist this perfect opportunity to introduce our protagonist for today. The legendary, the one and only 3458A bottom cover.
concealing the other bottom cover, underneath which we find the partially covered multi-slope analog to digital converter. Notice how there's a whole densely populated board doing a job that's normally done by a microchip these days. This integrating ADC implementation doesn't have a high input impedance because it uses its input voltage, the one it's supposed to measure, to charge its integrator capacitor for a fixed amount of time. Its predecessors simply used a fixed reference voltage to discharge the capacitor afterwards. The number of clock pulses, also known as counts, that it takes to reach zero happen to be proportional to the input voltage that had to be measured in the first place. That's a very elegant circuit because changes in the resistor value or the clock frequency matter little. They apply to both the run up and the run down slopes, so they cancel each other out in the end. Now the HP engineers looked at this established principle and thought to themselves, how can we make that a million times more complicated and maybe also a bit better since we are at it. Even in this basic simulation based on ideal components, one can kinda see that this circuit can only be fast or accurate. To allow the user to select between the two, more run up and run down slopes were added, each with a resistor of their own, configuring their steepness. This way unfortunately we no longer benefit from the inherent immunity to resistance changes through drift or temperature coefficient. Now the counts depend on the ratio of the slope resistors. Not a problem though, as we've seen before, precision resistor networks with excellent tracking coefficients were totally possible back then. Now the HP guys were like, hmm, this is still too easy. What if we told you that you don't even have to choose between speed and resolution? You can have both with no additional hardware. I mean, come on, it's a few more wires and logic gates. What else are you gonna put in that huge FPGA? Our biggest issue so far is the comparator's inability to detect the zero crossings precisely and immediately. There's always a little bit of over or undershoot where the slope is kept on too long and the clock keeps ticking. The improvement in this step is an algorithm that combines the fast and slow rundown slopes to get a result quickly and make it incrementally more and more precise. As before, a run up slope is turned on for some time, allowing the input voltage we want to measure to charge the integrating capacitor via a known resistor. Depending on the integrator polarity after that, this circuit can measure positive and negative voltages of course. The fastest rundown slope with opposing polarity is selected to steer the integrator back to zero. Each rundown slope has a weight associated to it based on how fast it is, like minus 1024 or plus 265. The counts each slope takes to cross zero are multiplied by that weight. Because everybody overshoots slightly, we can alternatingly use slower and slower slopes to get closer and closer to perfect zero, while at the same time correcting our counts by ever smaller numbers. This way we get the accuracy of the slowest slope, but we don't have to wait for it to do everything on its own. Alright, that's pretty complicated now. Surely that's it, right? Well, actually there are at least two more little tweaks on top of this foundation. But I'm not going to go into too much detail lest I lose the last two and a half viewers who made it through this segment. Somebody realized that it's possible to extend the effective input voltage range and therefore the resolution of the ADC by mixing run ups and run downs right from the start. One step forward, two steps back will keep you from running into a wall, that kind of thing. Because the amount of charge transferred into the integrator by these preliminary rundowns is very well known, they can just be accounted for mathematically later. The last idea deals with the sudden realization that the charges are actually not that well known after all. That's because the FET switches behave unpredictably during state transitions. The solution is to make sure that every measurement is based on the same amount of switch transitions. That way the unpredictability can just be calibrated out. I think those last two points are not that important to understand. They are just an explanation of why what we are seeing on the scope screen is so much more crazy than just shrinking triangles. Unfortunately we are seeing somewhat reasonable stuff on the scope screen. That means that the multi-slope rundown convergence error for which we came here in the first place is not revealing itself quite so easily. No big surprise really. This error is as well known as it is dreaded. It's often a death sentence for a 3458A, because it usually needs a $3000 replacement part, the whole ADC board. And that's not all. 
Keysight has recently stopped selling those to individuals altogether. So if you need one, you have to pay for a trip to a service center for their diagnosis and repair in addition to the actual hardware. The thing is, most of the analog magic I've just described in the previous segment happens inside a certain hybrid component with the innocent name U180. The bill of materials calls it the steering hybrid. Mine has an Agilent sticker on it, which means that in this unit it has been swapped before. The close thermal coupling of the custom silicon die with the custom tantalum nitrite resistor network for all the slopes, as well as the hermetic sealing of both in a ceramic package, might very well be the not so secret but very hard to imitate ingredient that makes this meter so special. It's a beautiful powerful part and a massive engineering accomplishment no doubt, but if something ever goes wrong in there, there's almost no chance of fixing it. Resourcefulxdevs.com documented a few very good attempts though. In addition to all the slope resistors, there are also three gain setting pairs in the package. In close collaboration with external op amps, they help buffer the reference voltage to three ADC references. Plus 12, minus 12 and plus 5, all of which are available conveniently on test points. I think they are a great first thing to look at when diagnosing ADC problems. Not that they would tell you anything terribly useful, only if your incoming voltage reference is steady, while at least one of the three local ADC references is drifty. Do you know that you are probably $3000 poorer? I used my second best voltmeter to log these for a few hours, and I found no excessive drift, which means that the search goes on. The next usual suspects are the comparators themselves. The ones that have to find zero but fail so predictably that it's become a fundamental part of the whole ADC system. Kind of embarrassing to be honest. Nah, not really. Obviously they've selected some very good comparators for this critical task, with a very wide input voltage range and a low propagation delay. This one seems to work alright as far as I can tell with a normal 8-bit oscilloscope, but who knows how small the excursions of the least significant slopes are. Maybe I just can't see them with my vertical resolution and the problem is hiding there. Hmm. These comparators are also known to run very hot in normal operation. That makes them suspicious by default in my books. In the earliest revisions of this board they used two Elantec DIP8 parts. As those became obsolete they were replaced with an equivalent dual channel comparator on a daughter board. <laughs> Nowadays both are obsolete, but after gambling a bit with UT source and various shady eBay shops, I think I was able to obtain a few genuine replacement parts and a pile of fakes and salvaged ones. These are probably the latter. Look at those unnaturally shiny pins, they totally retint them. Also compliments for the ESD protection and the paint job on these. Oh, such a convincing forgery almost had me fooled. Anyway, I read a few success stories involving replacement of the comparators, so that's what I'm going to try too. And in a sudden mood I decided that the tantalum caps on there were also ready for a change, so... Long story short, no success with either DIP or SMD replacements unfortunately. The sporadic multi-slope rundown convergence error remained exactly as it was. I tried a few traditional remedies too, like covering it with a warm PPM infused blanket. There, there, it's all going to be alright. But none of it really helped and the realization that we might actually have a U180 issue began to materialize. But before giving up I had one more idea to try. Every easily available component on this board, thrown into a digikey shopping basket, came out to just shy of 100 US dollars, i.e. nothing in comparison to 3000. So I decided to abandon sparsemanship and smart strategic troubleshooting for a while, in favor of a desperate brute force replace everything approach. Who knows, maybe the integrator capacitor has become leaky, the crystal oscillator has slowed down, a transistor has turned into a diode or there's a moody solder joint somewhere. I've seen it all before. <coughs> it wouldn't make for a particularly glorious YouTube video if I had to admit that I was unable to find the problem. And that all I could deduct was that it was caused by one or more basic electronic components. But I'm beyond caring now. I want my 3458A. I'm left only with resistors, inductors and a handful of semiconductors I couldn't find replacements for. 
Most of the caps on here are axially leaded multi-layer ceramic types. The original series called SA101 is still carried by AVX today. The one and only integrator cap at the center of it all. Doesn't even have to be some ultra expensive aerospace grade part. It's a normal 330 picofarad MLCC with a C0G dielectric. As described earlier, its absolute capacitance value matters little. Dielectric absorption and microphonics are likely much greater concerns. But C0G is said to be good in those categories. Originally I had the impression that this SensePeak PC Byte holder from our friends at Wheelectron was only made to facilitate probing on boards. But with the extra room below it's also great for those nowadays rare cases of leaded assembly. After having invested a hundred bucks and hours of work, I felt entitled to a victory at this point. And sure enough, I didn't hear the dreaded error beep for tens of minutes, so I dared launch a full self-calibration where every component is exercised a bit. But as you can tell from the remaining length of this video, the victory didn't last long. Aww. Understanding the fundamental principles of this ADC is one thing. Knowing what exactly it does, when, for how long, what it expects and how the multimeter settings influence it. Different story altogether. But based on what I now know I think I can make a confident guess as to what and where the 114 system error multi-slope rundown convergence is. I think it assumes, reasonably so, that the overall undershoot of each slope is limited because it's turned off within a finite time after crossing zero. So there's also a limit within which one can expect that each subsequent slower slope with opposing polarity will be able to find zero again. The HP journal specifically mentions 10 clock pulses, but I'm not sure if that's an example or the actual value. Either way, one can see how a broken or degraded comparator I see could disrupt this narrowing down, this converging on perfect zero. But since I've tried many replacements now and not once saw a change, I can only conclude that the problem is indeed inside U180, the steering hybrid. And that's unfortunately all I can say. It could be a bad element in the resistor network, a leaky or downright stuck switch for one of the less powerful slopes. Or since it happens erratically, maybe even something in the switch drive circuitry, which I assume uses charged capacitors to turn on switches with a high degree of consistency between cycles. This die shot is actually from our multimeter donor Extra Solar. He has much more detailed ones and big plans for them, which you might be able to see on his YouTube channel soon. But where does that leave us? Unfortunately with no other option than to swap the whole board. But I got a good deal on it by trading in my old broken one. OMG, I don't think I've ever handled a more important board than this. It's an earlier revision from 1993, pre-Agilent times and pre-SMD comparator daughter board. As far as I can tell though, all the revisions are mechanically, electronically and softwareically compatible. The Black Square is a Fujitsu FPGA that handles the ADC business. The pale purple square is probably an identical steering hybrid. Except for one little detail I hope. The Intel 8051 is actually the in-guard processor. In charge of all the internal workings on its side of the guard barrier. I.e. signal routing, controlling the AC board on the left and talking to the outside world via fiber optics. Oh boy, I've got a good feeling about this, but feel free to wish me luck all the same. Normally I'm opposed to assembly level repairs, but this one didn't leave me any other choice. And it looks like we do indeed have a winner this time. I wouldn't call this a satisfying repair, but here the outcome is what matters, and for that I am elated. But there is hope still. We've got at least one more problem on the AC board this time. With shorted inputs and rising AC voltage ranges, we are getting more and more crazy readings. Some error is to be expected because the covers are open and the PPMs can roam wild. But not 35 volt with shorted inputs wild, that's taking it a bit too far. 
We are also getting an error in the middle of the AC part of the self-calibration. Oh god, I think I'm getting triple beep PTSD from all this stress. Imagine the horror of it taking offense with its new ADC now for some reason. It is another convergence error, but this time of the flatness deck. Whatever that is. Personally, I'm still struggling with DC, so I might not be the best explainer for complicated AC facts and circumstances. But for some it might be an important part of this multimeter, so I'm going to give it a try superficially. While simpler multimeters usually only have one method of quantifying AC signals, with a fixed set of advantages and disadvantages, the almighty 3458A offers three or even four to cover most use cases. Three of them are at home on our next patient, the AC board. As always, the AC functions are just a preparation of the input signal, so that it can be read more easily by our friendly neighborhood ADC board. The oldest method of RMS to DC conversion, and still the one with the most street cred, is the one we've seen in the Fluke calibrator. Thermal converters take the definition of RMS literally and measure how much heat a signal can produce in a resistor. But for the 3458A with speed as one of its biggest selling points, such measurements take too long. That's why its default method is using op-amps to construct an analog computer that rectifies roots and averages. The averaging is done on a selectable capacitor instead of the thermal mass of a thermal voltage converter. That potentially gives this method the fastest settling times. All of that is actually available off the shelf as an integrated circuit too, the 8637. It's the very same part that's also used in the popular 34401 multimeter. Unfortunately these fundamental op-amps have neither an infinite bandwidth nor infinite slew rate. Which is why this method is not particularly well suited for the highest frequencies and crest factors. The 3458A's second AC method is not limited by any feeble op-amps. It's called synchronous subsampling and it delivers the most accurate readings, but works only on repetitive signals. It just digitizes waveforms and does the RMS conversion mathematically. The problem is to capture a waveform without losing too many significant details. It needs an ADC with a very high sample rate. As we've seen before, we've got a fast one available, but only if we sacrifice accuracy. To get both, we need another big brain moment. The 3458A can detect the period of a repetitive signal. Then it uses a sample and hold circuit to give the ADC all the time in the world to digest it. Subsequent samples can just be taken with a slight phase offset in the future, until the whole thing is memorized and ready for processing. The third method is the same, but with random timings. It is apparently the worst and only good for measuring wideband noise. The fourth method is another specialty that reaches highest precision at the lowest frequencies, from millihertz to around 1 kilohertz. Ronald Swirlane's algorithm runs on an external computer. It configures the DC voltage ranges of a multimeter in such a way that the RMS value and some other statistics of sinusoidal waveforms can be calculated with maximum accuracy by leaving the AC board out of the equation completely. Various interpretations of it are available on the internet, even a Python script. And while it was designed for the 3458A, it works with other multimeters too. If it works at all, that is. Alright, enough theory. Let's get down to business. On the AC board, these methods are preceded by precision, attenuation and amplification, so that everything between a microvolt and a kilovolt can be handled. These stages have a frequency-dependent response, meaning that they attenuate or amplify more or less depending on the input signal. That's unwanted of course, but the flatness deck is here to save the day. It's a 12-bit digital-to-analog converter. Just like the 52 other bits that are needed to configure this board completely, our deck in question gets its data from a long chain of shift registers. Its output voltage is injected into the attenuator circuit, where it can correct frequency response errors and improve flatness over the whole bandwidth. After spending multiple days troubleshooting this circuit, as in replacing random bits and pieces and hoping for an improvement, I had to concede and return to something a little bit more systematic. I noted the relevant configuration bits in all ACAL steps, hoping that that would guide me through the multitude of relays and analog switches. But holy moly was that still a headachey task. No kidding, I got two grey hairs in my eyebrows at the time. 
So during ACAL, the self-calibration, various test signals are generated on the A1 board, the big one we looked at first. These are routed to various places on the AC board using an analog switch and relays. To find out, for example, what our friend the flatness deck has to do to achieve perfect flatness. The yellow trace is test point 901, i.e. what's going to the ADC, after the AC board is done with it. Now if you look real close, you might just be able to tell what the error is. Got it? Hmm, me neither. Here it is again. Huh, we might have to look elsewhere. I'm just kidding. Obviously we are sending a brutal plus minus 15 volt square wave into the ADC. The ADC's full scale range being plus minus 10 if I may remind you. I wouldn't even be terribly surprised if an upstream defect like this was what hurt our previous steering hybrid. But where does it come from? I've replaced some and tested nearly all components. This time yellow is the output of our low voltage attenuators and blue is their input. The configuration bits agree they should be configured for unity gain. So that's alright, but why are they so bottom heavy? Good news everybody, we got them. This is our prime suspect Q802, otherwise known to his co-conspirators as 2N4392, an n-channel JFET. I tested it a few days ago with a transistor tester and awarded it the white dot after seeing it pass. But now that I've built this sophisticated test setup to make my case against it, it finally seems to have gotten cold feet. Here's what seems to have transpired. The perpetrator has developed excessive gate leakage. In those phases of the ACAL program in which it is given minus 10 volt by U801C, it manages to pull down all the calibration input voltages. I could imagine the controller trying to compensate for that using its flatness deck. Which would explain why we were seeing main amplifier output voltages railed at minus and plus 15 volt. But I'm not sure about that. What I do know is that no excessive readings are visible anymore with shorted inputs and ACAL AC is going through without complaints after a quick and cheap Q802 replacement. And that's pretty much it. Now there's only a few more minor things to do and to see before we can start testing. One such delicious detail I couldn't help but point out is right here on the AC board. There's about a meter of coiled coaxial cable connected to some low leakage node. It's a PTFE dielectric. Fancy stuff. I don't think it's a Wi-Fi antenna and neither is it for an unused option. It is actually the sample and hold capacitor that stores points of AC waveforms while the ADC digitizes them. Spaceworthy PTFE capacitors exist in more traditional shapes too. But those can cost hundreds of dollars per piece. If this fulfills the requirements of ultra low leakage and dielectric absorption, then it's a very clever and cost effective solution. Down here is an outguard power supply and front panel control board. It came partially recapped from one of the previous owners. Only this 8.3 millifarad chonker I suspect to be original. Understandable because that is a very hard to find part. It's only involved in digital power supplies though, so unless I'm getting major backlash in the comments, I think I'm going to give it one of these 10 millifarad ones which are available. Ah yes, the controversial matter of the cooling fans. Originally there was a Pabst Type 612L 0.7 watt fan in there, and unless it doesn't work anymore, I officially don't recommend changing anything about that. Because if we've learned anything in this video, it's that these HP engineers were terribly smart and have probably selected the perfect fan for the job. Internal temperature is one of the most important parameters of these meters and I think it's best not to make it angry. That being said, mine is way too loud. I want to operate this meter 24-7 as one does and work a few meters away from it. The perfect solution would be a soundproof, climatized server cabinet. But while I don't have one, I thought I'd try this 1.4 watt ultra low noise Noctua that a few people in the EEV block forum have been recommending. It makes an audible difference in noise and an almost immeasurably small difference in internal temperature. So I think it's a suitable affordable replacement. But at the time of editing this video I've already installed an even quieter fan. A Pabst 622 just for testing purposes. 
It is more quiet because it pushes less air than the other two candidates. But it's the one that Keysight uses in their new black instruments with nearly identical circuits. Again, not yet recommended. I'll let you know how the test goes. No kidding, in the very first night of what I thought to be a 24-7 operation, I was rudely awakened from my PPM pipe dreams by a loud pop followed by some hissing. While opening the meter again I was wondering if an irreplaceable $3000 steering hybrid could exhibit such behavior. Luckily it was just the classic Schaffner mains filter that got me good. In spite of its tar filling, moisture had seeped into it, allowing some leakage currents to flow. The resulting heat melted the tar and made some film caps blow up. That caused some liquid tar to drizzle out, accompanied by a uniquely revolting stank. 3.6 Röntgen, not great, not terrible, but definitely worse than a vaporized tantalum cap. I can't even show it to you because this natural disaster had to be disposed of far away from my home. But I've learned my lesson. Now vintage Schaffner mains filters are on the same replace on first sight list as carbon composition resistors and electrolytic caps. I had a few minor issues with cracked plastic parts here and there. And one bigger one where all the mounting points of the front facing terminal blocks were destroyed. That's what happens when these are literally thrown into the e-waste dumpster and land on their faces. Plastic and heartbreaking as reality often tends to be. This specimen at least will be healed soon and treated appropriately forever. Of course I can't keep my hands off the voltage reference. The selected and factory aged LTZ1000A in here is normally disguised by an HP internal part number. That one was actually delivered with the meter, whereas in its place sits a new one. By default these reference boards have a 15K 1K voltage divider that sets the LTZ1000 oven temperature to a scorching hot 90 degrees C. That allows these meters to be operated in high ambient temperatures up to 55 degrees C at the cost of higher reference voltage drift. European summers are getting hotter and hotter every year, but I think we are still a few years away from reaching 55 degrees C. So I would prefer for now a lower LTZ temperature and lower reference voltage drift. For that I'm installing the classic 13K 1K voltage divider, which will lower the LTZ oven temperature to 60 degrees C. Some VHD 200 voltage dividers like this one are nowadays available on DigiKey with 15 weeks lead time. The reference board design is pleasantly pragmatic, no esoteric flex PCBs or thermal cutouts anywhere. Just a little plastic cup to keep air currents still around the hottest part. And last but not least, the digital mainboard. Back when I was super desperate about my non-functional ADC board, I erased the EEPROM and gave it the latest firmware revision, hoping that that would make it more tolerant or something. Didn't work of course, but the latest firmware is beneficial anyway I guess. The smallest battery powered Dallas NVRAM on the left should hold the calibration data. The two bigger ones are for saving configurations and measurement results I think. All of them are relatively fresh and socketed which is not factory standard. So I think they have been serviced recently. They should last for 10 years or so, but I just can't stand Dallas time bombs. So I'm going to replace them all with ferroelectric memory with a casual data retention time of 150 years without any battery power. I made these adapter boards primarily for this multimeter, but they are pin compatible to their Dallas counterparts so they should fit everywhere. These are blank now. I guess I could have copied over some calibration data at least, but after having tampered with literally everything, a full external calibration is in order anyway. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Damn, now I'm almost sad that it's over. But it's really not. Now the real fun begins. Now we get to calibrate the meter, which really is a rare and special thing to witness. Because usually a 3458A is killed once or twice a year by some external authority. Then its memorized calibration constants can be worth a few thousand US dollars and no normal owner will risk screwing around with them. But since we are in a blank state anyway, we can do just that. First we need a high performance short circuit to determine zero of all the ranges. 
High performance for a short circuit sounds ridiculous. But this thing must have a very low resistance while also not generating any thermal voltages. The calibration instructions recommend a thin piece of copper wire. But I always seem to lose or bend those out of shape. That's why I designed this weirdo on a very thin PCB. Quick equilibrium thanks to low thermal mass. Bare copper, plated edges and enough PCB overhang to insert and extract easily. And it's probably some kind of Nordic rune too that will bring you the blessings of the PPM gods. I'll still give it a few more minutes for thermal equilibrium because I touched the binding posts and those do have a bit more thermal mass on their own. Then with the front rear switch in the front position I'll enter Cal Zero. And everything else happens blissfully automatically. This adjustment of DCV, ACV, DCI, ACI, ohms and more takes about 5 minutes. About as long as it took me to speak this cursed line flawlessly. The same is necessary for the rear terminal block, but only for this zero adjustment. The offsets for all the other functions and ranges are determined automatically. The instrument must be aware whether it is using the front or the rear inputs. Because I can just flip the switch, enter Cal0 again and a second set of offsets is created and applied accordingly in the future. Next the 10 volt adjustment where most importantly the precise value of the internal voltage reference is determined. Based on that in turn almost everything else is calc later. For this a good cable is necessary with properties similar to our high performance short circuit. I'm using a teflon isolated silver plated 4 wire copper cable. Shielded with crimped pure copper lugs and a glass of 25 year single malt whiskey no eyes on the side please. I'm setting the guard switch to open connecting the cable shield to it and the other side of the cable shield goes to the DC standard guard if available or output low if not. When in doubt as to which DC standard to use a good rule of thumb is the better one. From here we just enter Cal followed by the exact voltage of the external standard. And you may have guessed it the rest happens automatically. This step takes only about 2 minutes. Not even enough for a proper depressing twitter session. The next and last step in a normal artifact calibration needs a resistance standard. Ideally in the 10 kilo ohm neighborhood but drastically different values work too with some derating of the specs. Enabling offset compensation is optional but recommended for best results. We'll talk more about that feature in the next video. We'll also have to look at the external AC calibration which is necessary after either modifying something on the AC board or wiping all the calibration memory. Not sure if having both conditions makes them cancel each other out but at the moment I don't have the necessary equipment here anyway. For now we have the most important ranges calibrated so we can lean back, put the meter to work and let it measure something trustworthy for a few months. That'll show if both the new ADC and the new LTZ are good. And since this video took so damn long to edit I actually don't have to leave you with a cliffhanger this time. I've got about a month's worth of Fluke 732A data. And based on that I think I can pronounce my final judgement already. This meter is as good as the legends promised. Even in the chaotic ambient temperatures of my rooftop apartment. I've recorded no more than 1 ppm peak to peak over a whole month. What's more, by running ACAL which is the source of all the visible jumps. I can always return to just about 0 ppm no matter the temperature. The manual recommends performing a self calibration after every 1 degree C ambient temperature shift. Had I automated that in this test it would have given us an even cleaner result. And that is finally all for today. Thank you for watching. Check out the links in the description for all the materials I referenced throughout this video.